Welcome. My name is Douglas Gabriel. I'm the author of a new book that I'd like to give you an introduction to today. I'm very excited about this book because it took 40, 45 years of research to finally come up with a couple ideas that have been put in this book. But the book has turned into three books. So there's an introduction called The Eternal Ethers. There's the, that book is really the theory. It's kind of the overall philosophical view of the curriculum that Waldorf uses, what Rudolf Steiner created, the Waldorf Curriculum. And the second book is called The Eternal Curriculum. And that curriculum is, in fact, an extrapolation and a commentary on Waldorf education, but the way that Waldorf education merges with all other forms of education that have been studied in all these years. That I've been a teacher trainer, which is about 37 years, I believe. And I've been training in Waldorf education myself for over 40 years. I have actually a lot of experience in Waldorf education, having been a teacher trainer and trained hundreds if not thousands of teachers and of course spoken to thousands of teachers both in Waldorf education, public education, and parochial education. So this heart of the book, The Eternal Curriculum, was initially called Wisdom for My Children. Inside of The Eternal Curriculum is basically an interpretation of the Waldorf idea that a child recapitulates the entire development of mankind. There's a term for that. It's called ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. In other words, the individual recapitulates the development of all of mankind. That is the eternal curriculum. But you also might ask, well, how is that? That's the past, but what's the future? And that's the secret. That's what's in the first book. If you understand the etheric body, which as a Waldorf teacher and a Waldorf teacher trainer, the number one thing that you're told is a child from 7 to 14, you're teaching the etheric body. But then you're seldom ever told what the etheric body is, how it works, what constitutes it, where do we find it, how can you understand it philosophically. And that's why the first book was created. Once a few people helped me understand after 30 years of teaching Waldorf education, someone, a very naive teacher trainer, pointed out to me a few things by asking a few questions, and it made all the charts and diagrams that I had made for all those years kind of seem silly because it pointed out that the Waldorf curriculum, that, which is the best curriculum that I've been able to find, even though uh, Gene Gebser, uh, William Irwin Thompson, a friend of mine, uh, uh, there's a number of other people who have other views of the way that you can parcel out the development of mankind's recorded history and how that kind of develops into a collective consciousness that we would say that a child can grow into. You know, the child that we have who comes into the modern age is a collection of everything from the past, but what we don't notice when we look at the Waldorf education system is that the future is there also. So you have to start asking the question, Sure, we can teach the past, we can see some of the past in the curriculum as we look at the literature that's taught, first grade through eighth grade. For those who don't know Waldorf education, the teacher stays with the same group of children from first through eighth grade. But Rudolf Steiner says we're teaching the etheric body from age seven to 14. Well, there's a missing year, that's the eighth grade. And Rudolf Steiner says that the first grade student should be seven. In, when they are in first grade. So they have to be seven. <clears throat> the reason for that is the second teeth have to have come in. And you're watching the teeth, and the teeth are the, um, the earmark of that particular development in child uh, growth. And so when you look at the teeth at seven, it shows that the child is really ready to be educated. But what really is happening from seven to 14? In the second book, which is called the Eternal Curriculum for Wisdom Children, Intuitive Learning and the Etheric Body. That's a lot to try to wrap your mind around. Let's look at that first concept to begin with. Eternal Curriculum for Wisdom Children. Who are these wisdom children? Well, in the book, it is made not only for students and the curriculum that they have from seven, from grade eight, one through seven, seven through 14, eight, seven through 14, but it's also for parents. It's also for teachers. So anyone can look at book two, The Eternal Curriculum for Wisdom Children, and you can be the wisdom child looking at this book. Because we give examples of what you teach the child at that age, and if you were the teacher or the parent 
a teacher in any, whether, you know, parochial school could also use this same curriculum. We made it so open and universal that it could be applied for anyone. Or if you had a bad education, you can go to this eternal curriculum oh. and re-educate yourself, you see. So what we have here is examples for students and examples for what we call teachers, which could be homeschooling and parents in any circumstance you can imagine. So it really is a re-education of your own etheric body. But what is often forgotten is, even if you want to study all the past, and for instance, I have studied it quite, quite extensively, being a Waldorf teacher and also in other capacities, when you look at the cultural development of mankind through religious, mythological, archeological ideas, what is it that you come up with? Are we more advanced than the Greeks who believed that Zeus was on top of a mountain grasping his thunderbolts, lightning bolts, and throwing them at those that he wished to strike? Do we really understand lightning any better than the Greeks did? The ideas that they had embodied what we could even call science now. And that is what we are doing with the Eternal Curriculum, and particularly the first book, The Eternal Ethers, which is subtitled A Theory of Everything. And if you understand the ethers from Rudolf Steiner's perspective, you will understand his cosmology, which is, goes from the beginning of time to the end of time. It starts in a place where there was no time called duration, and it will return to that place after it goes through seven cycles to duration. So in fact, we are talking about the seven cycles that make up time. So the child from first through seventh grade replicates that, but also the shocking news which came to me is a naive teacher trainer asked me these questions and I'm saying, oh, that's right, that is what the etheric body is and what it's supposed to do. And yes, it theoretically, the entire future of mankind's development should be in the etheric body. So if you're looking at the etheric body of the child as it's developing, you should see the future. Well, how does that come to play in the curriculum? We put forth a comprehensive theory that was uh, first found by these naive questions and then it was ran by many Waldorf educators who have all asked me to please put this in writing. So that is the reason that the second book came into existence. The first book had to come into existence because as you study Waldorf education, you're going to be told you need to understand the etheric body, but there are no comprehensive books on it. The most comprehensive book by Gunter Voxmuth called The Etheric Formative Forces in cosmos, earth, and man is not even allowed to be studied in anthroposophy because they say there's mistakes in it. And so you have the supposed the greatest compilation of understanding that was directly conducted with Rudolf Steiner's approval through Gunter Voxmuth, his secretary, in that book, Etheric Formative Forces. They will tell you it's incorrect, but they won't tell you why it's incorrect. Well, what we did in the first book is we took all the research of all the anthroposophists as well as the entire theories of ethers going back to ancient Hindu theories, on through the Greek theories, on through all theories and modern theories, including Sir Isaac Newton, including Einstein. Einstein believed in an ether, the luminif luminiferous ether. Newton believed in an ether. Aristotle believed in the quintessence, which was an ether, he called an ether. You can't come up with a good scientist who came up with anything near a theory of everything that didn't include the ethers. The problem is, it's generally considered to be four ethers. Well, that's a start. Then the ancient Hindus believed there was the fifth ether. That's the next step. And Steiner points out the fifth ether. But there's a sixth and a seventh ether, which is found almost exclusively through Rudolf Steiner's works. Very hard to understand, almost never addressed by anthroposophists, because it's called the tree of life. Well, if you don't understand the tree of life, then you don't understand the future that is found in the etheric body of the child from 7 to 14. And that's what the teacher needs to understand as they're watching the child develop. Because remember, education comes from the word educare, to draw forth. We're not putting into the child education. We're not instructing the child. All we can do is draw forth the child what they have is inherent capacities. It, since I'm speaking to anthroposophists and Waldorf teachers in this particular video, I can say some things that are very wide sweeping and come from the study of man. If you do not believe in reincarnation, you cannot be a Waldorf teacher because the child's entire 
work from their previous incarnation, from everything they did in their willpower, is now in their head. And as you look at the head of the child, Steiner says many, many times, at least 50 times, he, he emphatically says, study the head of the child. When you study the head of the child, you have who they are bringing from the past with them. But that's not the future. Our job is to allow them to blossom into the future. Even inherent capacities that they come in with, these what you would call wisdom children, these children who have amazing capacities, are those the capacities we should enhance in education? Maybe, maybe not. We have to let that come forth from the child. And that's the wisdom child. The wisdom child is inherently calling the teacher to please give them what they need in that particular stage of growth and development. And Rita Steiner points that out better than anyone, even though they coincide with Piaget and even Montessori's stages of development and many, many others. Rita Steiner gives us the most comprehensive view of that, those stages and what to give the child at that time. But the problem is it's not chronological, giving the children German fairy tales. And then later in the fifth grade, giving them ancient India, ancient Persia, ancient Egypt. It doesn't line up in a chronological order. So when you teach the literature curriculum of Waldorf education, it is not chronological. And these were the naive questions that people asked me. Why is it not chronological? Are we not teaching the etheric body, the time body? Are not the images of these very cultures impressed into the etheric body and that's what the children need as nourishment at those stages? Yes, yes, that's all true. Well, why isn't it chronological, Dr. Gabriel? <laughs> why, your theory doesn't work here. And uh, I'd say, well, you know, I'd broken it down into all kinds of subsets and, you know, lined it all up and did everything I possibly could. And I actually had some charts that people thought were, maybe had gone too far with an interpretation of the curriculum. Well, that's because it didn't work. The one that we now have works perfectly. And so if you're a Waldorf teacher and you're looking at the headings under each of the grades, those words, if you understand what it means, the Saturn incarnation of the earth, and you understand that's what a first grader is, and you also understand that's the Polaris first stage of the seven stages of the incarnations of the earth, which is the seven stages of metamorphosis are found in everything from the incarnations of the earth to the lives and the lifespan of a monarch butterfly. It's found everywhere. And that's what the first book points out. So once you get that, it's also found in nutrition. It's also found in the elements. It's found in the sevenfoldness of everything, from music to the planets to whatever you wish to apply it to. That's why it's a theory of everything. But seldom ever does anyone, except the anthroposophists, point out there's a sixth and a seventh ether and what they are. Because they're mysteries of the future, just like the sixth and seventh chamber of the heart that Rudolf Steiner refers to. These are mysteries of the future. The fifth chamber of the heart is supposed to be revealed now. And when that's revealed, you'll understand that the heart is no longer a pump. My friend, Ralph Marinelli and John Barnwell and some others have proven that the heart is not a pump. And now it's known by science. It's even in Scientific America and many of the heart specialists all say, oh yes, we, we always knew the heart was not a pump. But he said that when that was revealed, then Waldorf education would really be able to expand. And it has. And once that was revealed, you now see Waldorf Education Online. You see Waldorf Teacher Training Online. This would have been unheard of in, the, in my day of training because you weren't allowed to even use TV. You weren't allowed to use videos. You weren't allowed in any way to try to communicate what we should be up in a classroom and doing movement, the eurythmy movement, and everything I'm teaching you we should have done first. And that's easy to do. And that's implied in, and given in my first book called The Spirit of Childhood, which can be uh, in the comments box. It will tell you below this video how to get that book for free. But you can get that book for free, and it tells you how to teach first grade, what to teach, the songs, the rhymes, everything. It lines up the whole first grade for you, and then it has a lot of other articles talking about Walter education. That book has reached over 10,000 people, both uh, as a book and electronically. What we're doing is we want to give that book to you if you need it and you're a first grade teacher and you want to be a home school teacher and you want all the details and you want all the things that I could show you by jumping up and being in a classroom with a... I'm only happy when I have a group of 30 people that I can do uh, dancing with, circle dancing with, because in circle dances I can teach you mathematics and then you will have no problems with mathematics. 
Mathematics has to come up through the limbs. It has to come through the legs. So you have to do exercises that parcel out the fractions that are also rhythmic and beautiful and have songs and dance and movement to them. And it becomes natural because what we're trying to do with the eternal curriculum is teach eternally good habits. Rudolf Steiner said we are actually instructing the children's breath. But breath is the secret to all things, but you can't become conscious with it, as he says. But every time you sing lyrics, you're controlling the breath. You're making it rhythmic. You're making it beautiful and melodic. So, what we are doing in the Waldorf curriculum is we're trying to teach habits that then when the child is faced with an ethical situation, they fall back to the eternally good habits of what we taught them in the Waldorf classroom through the ritualistic, almost prayer-like verses that we say every day, rhythmically, for years, until they really are embodied in the soul of the wisdom child. So in any normal Waldorf classroom, they have a lot of these things, but they don't break it down, and the teacher usually cannot tell you what they're doing. And so that's the reason for the third book. The third book we give to you uh, for free, because you can go to eternalcurriculum.com, and you can get the pieces of this book, as well as videos that give you a little bit of instruction about the content. That book was created because I had to keep training public school teachers to be Waldorf teachers. Here in Michigan, I was part of, again and again, charter schools that incorporated Waldorf methodology into them. Well, Waldorf would tell you, the Waldorf movement would sit back and say, there is no methodology to Waldorf teaching. It is the inner content of the teacher that comes forth to the student, that, that, that's all true. But sorry, we also can use some of those methodologies and improve test scores. I took, in the, one of the worst schools, this school had actually been closed, they closed it, it was so bad. And uh, I became the principal of that school, and it had terrible scores. And I said to the teachers on the first, when I met with them the first day, I said, if you do with what I tell you to do, we will be famous in this state, and this school will be famous for the incredible score ascension that we're going to have here. And they all laughed. I said, all you have to do is a few things. Every morning you push your desk and chairs aside, you make a circle, and you do some circle dancing. You sing. And then you sing lyrics and you have them answer. So you call and answer, both with singing and with, with poems and with you know vocal call and answer, so that they hear, they incline their ear. People don't understand. The bone of the ear doesn't hear anything until it inclines towards what you're listening to. You can hear it all, but you're not listening. When you incline your ear, that can actually be seen in the child. And you can learn these things because this, this is the intuitive learning curriculum. I'll tell you why it's called intuitive in just a minute. But in these exercises that you do, call and answer exercises, mental math, singing, and playing the recorder, if you play the box flute, the recorder, this enhances brain development, period. Any movement of the fingers in rhythmic order causes the brain to develop faster than anything else that I know of, that I've seen in any research, except a few other things which we won't be talking about much on these tapes. Substances, literally, that can cause your brain waves to change. But that's neither here nor there. The point is that all you have to do is teach the child recorder. So if their feet are moving, their hands are moving, their minds are moving, then you sit down, all scores go up. That's what we did, 70 points, 72 points in one year. Standard score of the school was below failing to completely proficient. They assumed we lied and cheated. They sent in everyone to, this was a state school, charter school. They sent in everyone to see what we were doing. And when they saw what we were doing, they sent everyone to us because they said this is the model school to follow. It only takes stealing a little bit of the methodology of Waldorf education and applying it to get results. But that's not how you're going to get the good spiritual results. The good spiritual results come by what you learn, what you learn in a Waldorf teacher training course. You have to study for a year anthroposophy before you can become a Waldorf teacher. That's the normal standard thing. That's no longer the way they do it, but that's the standard thing. Study all branches of anthroposophy for a year so you get the big picture. Then you go into Waldorf education. That takes a year, and then you have to become certified in the state. That takes years. So if you really look at the whole thing, and I have a BA in Anthroposophical Studies and a Master's in Waldorf Education, and I've been an instructor at a, well, uh, University of Detroit in Mercy for years and years and years, decades, 
And so I know what I'm speaking about. I've trained hundreds, if not thousands, of teachers. I also trained in Hawaii, University of Hawaii. I've trained at Spring Valley, at all these places. So the point is, what I have distilled here is something that can be used by anyone. We cannot hold this as a parochial key to education exclusive to Waldorf schools. Because Waldorf schools sometimes work and sometimes they don't work so good. What we need to do is get this in the hands of those who can use it. Everyone. They will see the results immediately. And then later, I helped open a charter school that became the number one charter school in the state of Michigan. And people came there and looked at that school. Why? Because these were teachers who had no exposure to Rudolf Steiner, Anthroposophy, Waldorf Education, anything spiritual, even if you said soul, they would look at you like, soul? You think we have a soul? <laughs> so I had to instruct these teachers. And the third book called Intuitive Learning does the following. It's the simplest way to take Waldorf Education and manifest it. Intuitive learning is when you merge your thinking, feeling, and willing into an action. So if you're singing, memorizing a song, and dancing, that's intuitive learning. It's engaging the will. What we call in education, there's the cognitive realm, the affective realm, the psychomotoric realm. Well, the psychomotoric realm is the realm of the will. And intuitive learning says, get up and do it first. Then sit down and talk about your experience. That's intuitive learning. We all know what is right when we do it because it either works or it doesn't. So the problem with trying to train a public school teacher to be a Waldorf teacher, which some will say is impossible and I should have never tried, but I've done this even in prison schools for the last dozen years, affect prison schools all over America using these simple, simple, simple tools. And that's in the third book, and we give that to you for free because we want to give that to the whole world so that they can apply it. But if you are a highfalutin anthroposophist and you want to get to the top, and you want to understand the secrets of anthroposophy, you cannot get there without understanding the ethers, period. If you do not understand the etheric body, then you do not understand the etheric return of Christ. You do not understand the living nature of levity. You do not understand the hierarchy, and you cannot understand dissension without understanding the etheric body. In the first book, The Eternal Ethers, because of the research that had to go into this for 40 years to try to present to teachers what they need to know as they're observing a child, they also told me, you know, when I would say, I want to know about the ethers, they'd say, well, go grow a garden. So I became a biodynamic garden. Oh, no, oh, go, go be a leisure color, go, go veil paint, go study eurythmy. Go. So I tried all of that, right? No, it comes back to the child. Rudolf Steiner said there are only a few paths of initiation left in the modern world. One of them is to be a Waldorf teacher. One of them is to take, of course, the Christmas Foundation meditation, Foundation Stone meditation, work with that. And then you can work with anthroposophy, according to some anthroposophists, they say. But the number one path is to observe a group of growing children consciously. And if you do that, you will see the etheric body. But you will also see not only the past, you will see the future. And that is what is in the second book. It is a comprehensive understanding of ontogeny, recapitulates phylogeny, according to the Waldorf, educate, Waldorf curriculum, but enhanced with everything else that has been brought into the picture and supplemented by the philosophy of the ethers, a new theory of everything, and then put into direct application so that you know that it works by the third book called Intuitive Learning. So this trilogy of books started off as one, but we could not present them until they were ready to actually be usable in a very real way. So it took literally 10 years of writing to write this book, these three books, and another 20 years of applying it in the field to make sure that it actually did work. So this is a tried and true method, and if um, you are a parent and you know nothing about Waldorf education, or you're a deep anthroposophist, in the scope of this trilogy of books, you will find what you would need to know to truly understand a comprehensive view of Waldorf education and the way that the wisdom children that come to us today already know that this is what they're looking for. We just need to make sure that we provide it for them and that we do it consciously.